Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. We are excited to start our new series, Reflect, but before we do, I have a question. How many of you remember those crazy distortion mirrors in the fun house, usually at the fair? They were the weirdest thing. I have no idea why someone thought looking at a distorted image of yourself was a good idea. Like, who, I mean, whoever thought of that idea in the first place? Oh, let's make ourselves look really weird and people will pay to go see that. It's stupid. But today, we don't have to go to the fair. We don't have to go to the fun house. We just pull out our phone, flip open Snapchat or some other weird app, and you get fat face. I have no idea why somebody thought that was a good idea. Like, who ever thought we would want to see ourselves with, like, 100 extra pounds on our face? Like, it's terrible. But this is, my, this is one of my most favorite birthday presents ever. I came in. Oh, yeah. I came in. Uh, after I was, you know, that my birthday, and I came into my office on a Tuesday morning, and lo and behold, I open up my computer and turn it on, and this is what greets me. That is my daughter, Samara, on the left, and yours truly, your pastor, Melissa Blackwood, on the right. And I laughed so hard. Some people have beautiful serene white beaches on their screensaver or wonderful nature scenes. This is still my screensaver five years later because I laugh every time I see it. It's just so hideous. It's just like, uh, it reminds you of that monster or whatever. So crazy. But that distorted you is just so funny. But here's my question for you today. What kind of reflection or what image is your life reflecting? Is your life reflecting a distortion? Or is your life reflecting the image of what a true human being is supposed to reflect? Do you know how a true human being is meant to be? And did you know you are a mirror? Look at the person beside you and say, I'm looking pretty good. <laughs> ah, got you there. Fooled ya. But you know what? You actually are a mirror right down to the way your brain is wired. There's a whole new area of science that studies what's called mirror neurons in the brain. And scientists are actually, they're actually, they're actually saying now that this capacity that humans have to be able to mirror one another or to imitate each other, it is the number one thing that sets us apart from every other creature. They used to think it was language, but now it's this. And they've done experiments that show all sorts of crazy things, how your brain lights up just by watching someone else do something. So right now, if I'm jumping up and down, you're sitting there uh, still, but in your brain, the part of your brain that connects to your hips and your legs and everything that physically enables you to jump, in your brain, you're jumping even though you're sitting still in your chair. That's how a mirror neuron works. That's kind of, that's kind of freaky. If you think about the implications of that are a little bit on the scary side, but everyone say, I was made to be a mirror. And that's what we're looking at in this series called Reflect over the next few weeks. But to start this out, to explain it a little bit more, we've got a video we're gonna watch. So let's media go ahead and roll it. So if you lived in ancient Bible times, odds are you lived under the authority of a king. And many of these kings claimed that they were gods, and they would even call themselves the image of God. Meaning they had authority to tell people what to do, order things to be made. Yeah, they got to define good and evil. And these kings would often make statues of themselves, which in Hebrew were called selim, often translated as idol or image. But for Israel, 
they didn't view their kings as the god. In fact, they were never supposed to even make images of God. It's exactly right, and that was really unique for that time and culture. This is rooted, first of all, in Israel's belief that you can't reduce the creator God down to any one thing in creation. But there's another reason. People aren't to make images of God because God has already made images of himself. When did he do that? Well, let's go to page one of the Bible. And the first person we meet there is God. He's the one with authority over all creation. He speaks and creation obeys. And he defines what is good and not good. In other words, he alone is king. But then surprisingly, as the pinnacle of all of God's creative work, he makes humans and he calls all of them the image of God. So he gives all humans the authority to rule. Exactly. That's what he goes on to say. He tells the humans to subdue the earth and to rule it. And so this task that once belonged only to elite kings is here in the Bible the task of every human being. This was a revolutionary statement in its day because all humans are being called to rule and to participate in the human project. So what does this mean? I mean, how are we all supposed to rule? So the picture we get in Genesis is gardening. Gardening? Yes, gardening. So they rule the earth by cultivating it, by harnessing all of the earth's raw potential and then making something more and new out of it. So growing food for each other. Yes, but that also includes growing families then, which become neighborhoods. And then they create communities where people are going to work and take care of each other and build businesses and cities that will expand to new places and so on. So ruling is really the day-to-day acts of our work and creativity. Yes, we take the world somewhere. This is humanity's divine and sacred task. Yeah, and this all sounds really nice. And humans have designed some pretty great things. But just as often we create things that cause a lot of suffering and a lot of injustice, so maybe we shouldn't actually be ruling. Yeah, so the Bible addresses this. In Genesis, what happens is that God gives humans a choice about how they're going to rule. So are they going to use their authority for the benefit of others, which is God's definition of good, or are they going to turn away and define good and evil for themselves and use their authority for self-advantage? And in the story, they choose to define good and evil on their own terms. And so this is the Bible's depiction of the human condition. So sometimes we pull off amazingly good stuff, but just as often, despite our best intentions, we act selfishly and we create evil in the world. And so we're stuck as mediocre rulers making a mess of things. But that's not the end of the story. So the Bible goes on and it makes this claim that all of this was resolved when God bound himself to humanity through Jesus. And he showed us what it looks like to truly rule as a human. So what does it look like? Well, Jesus ruled by serving and by seeking the best for others, by putting himself underneath them and loving not just his friends, but also his enemies. And that's not a typical way to rule. And not only that, Jesus confronted the consequences of all of the evil and the death that we have created by our messed up ways of ruling. And he takes it. I mean, he lets it kill him. And so when the New Testament writers looked back to Jesus' resurrection, they see a whole new future opening up for all humanity. Jesus is a new way to be human. Yeah, that's why they called Jesus the image of God or the new human. And not only that, they also believe that Jesus' divine life and power is now available to heal and to transform us to become our life and power. And this sounds really nice, but what does it really look like? So... Practically, the Apostle Paul said it looks like people being filled by Jesus' own presence and spirit, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and integrity and gentleness and self-control. He says this is the new humanity that God wants to create in us so that we become people in whom God's image is being restored, people who will move the human project forward. And that's actually how the story of the Bible ends. It's a renewed world where God is on his throne and his servants are all around him, but they're the ones ruling over this new world, taking it into new, uncharted territory with Jesus as their healer and their guide. Isn't that amazing? You know, if you've ever wondered about your purpose or why you are here on the planet, that describes it quite fully. You and I were made to be a mirror to reflect everything great about God. 
That's our purpose. That is our reason for being alive. And that's what we're actually going to explore in this series, what reflecting looks like in our day-to-day lives. Because, see, when we actually start to live this way, when we start to live like a reflection instead of just living for ourselves, this is where we start to fe- find, this is where we experience joy in life. These are the, that's when we start to experience fulfillment in life and we experience confidence and peace and a sense of satisfaction. See, we don't get those things by trying to build a great life. See, life isn't about how great our mirror is. Life is about what we're reflecting. And see, you want to find fulfillment in life, you start reflecting the right things. So, what are we to reflect? Well, you're going to discover that in a couple weeks. Next week is going to be super fun because next week is Shotgun Sunday. And if you don't know what Shotgun Sunday is, that doesn't mean we start giving out shotguns or shooting shotguns in the church. It means we have, we, we have six different speakers, three in each service, and this is in Edmonton as well, and each of them is going to have eight minutes, and they're going to share boom, 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 boom. That's going to be so fun next week. But over the next several weeks, we're going to look at what does it actually practically look like? What does it mean to reflect God in your work environment? What does it mean to reflect God when you're with your friends or when you're at home or with your kids or in your marriage or when you're by yourself? What does it actually look like? It is practical. But today, this week, we're going to look at what is it, how we reflect God's rightness. Now, when we start talking about rightness, our minds typically go down the direction of a moral perspective. In other words, follow the rules. These are the right rules. These are the wrong rules. Do this. Don't do that. Follow the rules. Isn't that true? We tend to think of right being from a moral perspective. But God's rightness is actually something so much different. It's something so much deeper. God's rightness simply means the way things are supposed to be. In other words, there's no distortion. God's rightness is when there's no distortion. And I like how the video described it. God describes what good is. Good is power being used to serve others. So when we're doing something in, we're not, when we're thinking of selfless and we're thinking of others first, that's one of the ways that we reflect God's rightness. And this is what Jesus came to make possible again. I love how the video worded it. It says, God bound himself to humanity through Jesus, and he showed us what it looks like to truly rule. Or in other words, Jesus showed us what it truly looks like to reflect him in a right way. That's what Jesus came to do. He came as a, the new way to be human. I liked how they described it. Jesus is the new human. Everyone say new human. New human. And, you know, another author and pastor, he described Jesus this way. He said, Jesus met every dark situation of lack, sin, torment, and disease with a redemptive solution. He never made an excuse for the problem, nor did he allow the problem to remain. He always settled the issue by demonstrating what the Father's will was. And, you know, Paul, in the book of Ephesians 4, in verse 24 He described this. He described us this way. He said, for God has recreated you all over again. Everyone say, I've been recreated. You've been recreated. God recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness. And you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. See, that is what Jesus has made possible through the cross, through the resurrection, He made that possible for every single human being on the planet. Now, not every human being is living in it, but that's what the whole purpose of baptism is. See, those that are getting baptized, oh man, it's going to be so exciting because you know what they're doing? They're not just going through a ritual. They're not just going through a church membership thing. They're saying, yes, I want to step into this new way of being through Jesus Christ. That's the power of baptism. Baptism is our entrance into the reality that Jesus established for us. So you can go your entire life and miss out on an amazing life. You can miss out on being the true you. You can even go to your grave and you can go into all of eternity missing out on the way God created you to be. 
But we were made to in his perfect. I love this. We were recreated all over again in his perfect righteousness. All of those things that we look at as the black marks against us or our failings or our mistakes or our failures, Jesus dealt with all of it at the cross. And when he died on the cross and he went into the grave, he left all of that broken, messed up stuff in the grave. And when he rose again, he came out as a new human and he said, now this is a way it's available for all of you. Do you want it? It's yours. That's a pretty good gift. So, I'm going to make it super easy. I've only got two things today, two points. Everybody see, I can do two. You can do two. You don't have to be a super spiritual person to do these. You don't even, you don't have to be perfect. You can be a child and carry out these two ways of reflecting. Everyone say it again. I can do two. Here's the first one. Number one, the primary way that we reflect God is through worship. It's through our worship. Now, for those of you that don't like music and you show up late to church after the music is just about done, I don't understand that because music is amazing. But just before you turn out and thinking, dear God, what? I don't ever want to worship ever. Worship is not music. It's not. Music is one of the ways that we can worship God. But do you know the primary way that you worship? You worship through your job. God would not make something our number one thing to do and then have our life be occupied with a whole bunch of stuff that would prevent us from doing what we're supposed to do. Did you follow that? Do? See, worship is what we allow to dominate our imagination and our thoughts. See, what do you give your time, your energy, and you're focused to. In fact, someone once said, you want to find out what you worship, find out what you put most of your money to. See, worship, here's the thing about worship. We become like whatever we worship. We become like whatever we worship. And you know this. In fact, you probably did this when you were about 11, 12. Maybe some of you were a little bit the late bloomers and about 14 years old. How many of you remember your first crush? Oh, yeah, you remember? Okay, this, this is, thank you. I'm glad that you remember, Danielle. All of you others, you're old fuddy-duddies. Don't be an old fuddy-duddy. You, come on, you remember that first crush. You might have, maybe you were 10 years old and it was your teacher. Come on, how do you remember your first crush? You were so enamored by that person that all of a sudden, you started doing things you never liked to do before. All of a sudden, you hated hockey, but now you like hockey because he's a hockey player. Or you like football and you start studying football because she's a football player. There you go. Tricked you on that one. Or you like shopping because she likes to shop. Come on, you know this. You, when you worship, all of a sudden you start to become like what you worship. Now that is good if you're worshiping the right things. But if we're worshiping the wrong things, that's scary. Look at what in Psalm 115 verses 4 down to 8 it describes it this way. It says, unbelievers worship what they make, their wealth and their work. They idolize what they own and what they make with their hands. Everyone who trusts in these powerless dead things will be just like what they worship, powerless and dead. That's a bit sobering, isn't it? They'll be like whatever they worship. See, It works like this. If we start to worship stuff, we will become more and more artificial. In other words, we'll start to find our relationships become more shallow and shallow. If we worship other people's opinions, we will start to become what everybody else wants us to be, and we stop being our true self. Parents, we can worship our kids. If you worship your kids, you'll end up being buddy parent instead of the parent who actually leads and directs your kids with wisdom. See, if we worship, though, if we worship God, we become transformed to reflect Him, to reflect His nature, to reflect God's goodness. I look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. Paul, he said, we can all draw close to Him 
with the veil removed from our faces and with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured or transformed into his very image. That is powerful. As we move from one brighter level of glory to another, this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. See, you got an anger problem. I am all for going to anger management and getting practical tools to help you. But you will never be completely free until you start worshiping the God who will transform you to reflect his nature of peace. The God of kindness. The God of grace. You're struggling in an area in your life. It's, it, 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 you work on that. Get all the practical tools. But you can't leave out the most important ingredient about worshiping the God so that you can reflect his nature from that place of how he created you to be. See, worship is such a big deal because worship is the way we put things right in this world because worship was the way things went wrong in the world. See, when the first two humans chose self over God, that was a form of worship. See, the way everything went south on the planet wasn't so much a disobedience issue as it was a worshiping the wrong way issue. Worship is a big deal. Everyone say, number one, worship. Number two, here we go. This is a second primary way that we can reflect God's rightness is through our words. Man, there is creative power in our words. The video, it said God spoke creation into existence. And you know what? God shares that authority with you and I. He has made our words powerful. Look at Proverbs 18, 21. In the Passion Translation, the wisest man ever on the planet, this is what he, how he worded it. He said, your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. Your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. You know what? Again, this is what's so cool. Science has proven this. They've done experiments with plants that you speak negative words over plants. You just, all that they, they just spoke negative, like die sucker, die, 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 bad, bad, all sorts of negative things. You know what? The plants died. So you got weeds in your backyard? I suggest you go talk to the dandelions. Die, son. I think it's worth a try. Your neighbor might think you're a little bit loopy, but you just might have the clearest yard on the block. There's power in our words. And we greatly underestimate the power that we have in our We sang this in the second song today about our words. God was the word made flesh. Our words are powerful. God spoke creation into existence and he gives that, he shares that power and authority. See, it's not just our words, it's God's words spoken through us that carries power. This isn't about poof, I want you know, a cinnamon bun for lunch or whatever. I'm not talking about being stupid with our words. I'm not talking about being frivolous, but I'm talking about finding out what Jesus, everyone say the new human, the true way to be human, what did he speak to? Let's look at this. Look at Jesus. He spoke to barriers. Once the disciples were trying to prevent children from coming to Jesus, and Jesus is like, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. You know what? What barriers do you have in your life that you need to start speaking to and saying, uh, 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 not acceptable? Jesus spoke to confusion. He said, peace be with you. Jesus spoke to worry. He said, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Jesus spoke to injustice. He said, no more of this. When he was in the garden and one of his disciples, this was when they were coming to arrest Jesus, one of his disciples took a sword and, and, and cut off the ear of one of the servants of the guys that were coming to arrest Jesus. And Jesus said, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, that's not the way this is going to go down. 
That form of in, that form of you trying to get justice is the wrong way. You know what? I want to tell you, there's a right and a wrong way to establish justice. God is all about justice, but our broken humanness will often manifest it or reflect justice in a wrong way. Justice is not revenge. But God is a God of justice. And what did Jesus do? He healed the man's ear and he put it back on. Jesus spoke to potential. One of the disciples, when Jesus, he had gotten invited by a friend. And he, when the, his friend said, you got to come and see this Jesus guy. And Nathaniel's like, Jesus, he's from Nazareth? Like, can anything good come from Nazareth? And there was this guy like poo and Jesus and we're his own hometown. He was dissing his hometown. And Jesus, when he sees Nathaniel, you know what, Jesus? He didn't confront Nathaniel's bad attitude. He said, oh, right there is a true Israelite. Man, you are an awesome guy, Nathaniel. Jesus spoke to potential. I wonder who's been bad-mouthing you that you need to speak to their potential. Jesus spoke to impossibility when his disciples came and said, you know what? There are over 5,000 men here and their kids and women besides. You need to do something to feed them. And Jesus is like, no, it's all right. You feed them. He spoke to impossibility. I'm going to speak to all of the people getting baptized. It's time for you to go out the door. Follow Dennis. You can get up. You can go out and get changed. We'll call you back in here at the right time. He's going to go out there and go through. You know what? If you came here thinking, not planning to get baptized, but you're thinking, I need to get baptized, you can get baptized. We have extra clothes for you to get baptized in. You can get wet. We have all of the necessary things to make you look presentable after you get baptized if you would like to. If you are watching online and you're like, I need to get baptized, you know what? You have approximately 10 minutes to get here and you can get baptized. We will baptize you. But Jesus spoke to impossibility. Jesus spoke to all sorts of things that were not right to speak God's rightness. He spoke to condemnation. He said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus spoke to fear. He said, don't be afraid. Jesus spoke to doubt. He said, don't be faithless. Jesus spoke to storms. He rebuked the wind and the waves. And he said, stop. What storms are going on in your life that you need to start speaking to those things? You say, enough. Jesus spoke to a death sentence. He said, your son is going to live. Jesus spoke to sorrow. Jesus spoke to rejection. Jesus spoke to failure. Jesus spoke to disease. He said, be healed. Jesus spoke to disability. Jesus spoke to lack. Jesus spoke to need. You need to begin excited because these are all things you and I can speak to with the power and the authority of Jesus and things need to turn around. Jesus spoke to suffering. Jesus spoke to evil. Jesus spoke to the enemy. Jesus spoke to death. And Jesus spoke to a broken creation and said, it is finished. It is finished. See, our words are meant to enforce the absolute rule and authority of Jesus here on earth. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he said, all power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given it to me and I am giving it to you. You don't believe me? I am going to show you. See, Jesus confronted all of them. Again, back to the video. Jesus confronted the consequences of all the evil and death that we have created by our messed up ways of ruling. Jesus confronted it all. He did all the heavy lifting. Now our role is to enforce what Jesus has done. See, our words, again, back to the garden. It wasn't the way why the creation broke down and why everything fell apart. It wasn't so much a disobedience issue as it was a failure to rule against evil issue. See, when that snake came and whatever you, how we want to go to that, but when he's like, Eve, you should just take this apple... Her response should have been, ah, 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 ah. No. She failed to rule because she thought about herself. She took something she wanted, gave it to somebody else and said, you want this too and everything fell apart. See, what restores God's rightness into creation when God's new human, everyone say that means me, 
when we stand and we rule the way we're supposed to, not for ourselves, but using our power for others. See, what does it actually mean? See, to be filled with the life of Jesus and to follow Jesus, what does that mean? It doesn't mean to just have your sins forgiven and you can have this cushy life and God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. See, what it actually means to follow Jesus is to live in a way that enforces what he made possible what he has established. See, we are now the reflectors of God's rightness to brokenness, to darkness, to anything that is a contradiction to God's goodness. See, we have accepted far too much that is wrong. I'm going to say that again. We have accepted Far too much that is wrong. We tolerate what Jesus went to the cross and suffered and died to break, to deal with. And we tolerate far too much. And I love what, in that that video, where it says Jesus took all of that into himself and he died and he went in the grave and he left all of that in the grave and he rose again in new power. Man, what what is going on in your life that you have been tolerating. I mean, I read this story a couple weeks ago that there was a story about this girl who went to this church, it was in the States, and she received this incredible healing miracle, and she was telling another friend about it, and the friend told another friend who was suffering with a very serious disease, and she said, you need to go to that church over there. She wasn't even a believer. She told her friend, you need to go to that church over there because they don't tolerate cancer. You know what, something gripped me, and I'm just like, we have been too nice. There are things that we have tolerated out of ignorance, out of unbelief, out of complacency. And there's something that God wants to stir in us that will just say, this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. I am so tired of the cancer world. I'm so tired of unexplained freaky illnesses and weird diseases and tired of things that are, this is not right. You know what Jesus said? Oh, this is what's so crazy. Look at this. John 14, 12. This is Jesus' promise that he gave to his followers. That means you and I. He said, anyone who trusts in me will also do the works that I'm doing. In fact, look at this. They will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. You know what Jesus said over your life? You can do greater miracles than what he did. That is mind-boggling. But you know what else is crazy? Even before Jesus, pre-cross, pre-Jesus dealing with evil and death and sickness and all of that, God did all sorts of crazy miracles in the Old Testament. Walls came down around an entire city because people were shouting. That is crazy. God reversed time. God reversed time about 10 minutes, and another time the sun stood still. And you know what? Science can even prove it because there's about 10 minutes lost that they can't explain. God used a dead prophet's bones to bring another dead guy to life. That's crazy. These are all before Jesus. All of the crazy things. Man, we've accepted far too much. I had a completely different message prepared that I was ready to preach. But there's something that God is wanting to stir in us. God wants to stir something in you. We need to tolerate less of what's not right and expect more of what is right. And see, you know what? This is where Jesus, when he gave his disciples instructions, see, the number one way we use our words is through something called prayer. I know some of you, you don't pray because you've heard people pray weird. And you're like, I don't want to be weird. And I'm like, I agree with you. And if you're one of these weird prayers, stop praying weird because you reflect poorly on the rest of us. But if you're one of these people who goes into old King James, thus saith the Lord, and oh, dear God, and oh, dear God, and we just call upon your name. And sickness, stop praying like that. Nobody talks like that. This is weird. It's not going to bring a dead person back to life. They might stay in the grave if that's what they hear. But when Jesus told his disciples to pray, 
And he said, like, how do we pray? How do we do this? And he said, this is what you pray. You say, Father, you're in heaven and you're holy. You're set apart. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That was an invitation, but it was more than an invitation. It was a command. You know one of the commands, don't kill? It ranks up there higher than that command because it's part of a new thing Jesus was making possible as the new human for every human to become and to do. We have accepted far too much. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That means, God, your rightness be done. Jesus, in in Ephesians chapter 320, Paul, he wrote, he said, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. Everyone say it's God's power. It's God. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. And there's something God wants to kickstart in us in this season. And I believe more than anything else, this summer can be one of the craziest, most amazing summers of God and prayers if we will decide we've tolerated this too long. And I'm not talking about being stupid. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm not talking about going out and becoming so weird at work where you're like, I'm going to pray for you. And then you go into your King James English or weirdness. or Don't be a freak. Don't be weird. But recognize the power and authority God has given you. This is unacceptable. We're not tolerating cancer any longer. I am so done with that disease. And you know what? This doesn't mean we're going to get every single prayer answered. But you know what? Here's the good news. It's not up to us to answer the prayers. It's up to God to answer, and it's up to us to enforce. And I want to ask... We're gonna, I'm going to pray. I want to invite you. If you've got something in your life, life that you have tolerated for too long, it might be a physical condition. It might be a personal thing in your soul. It might be a character flaw where you have tried to get over this and you can't. It might be an addiction. It might be a relationship that is strained. It might be the state of your marriage where you're just like, I got so disappointed because I prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing's happened. You keep praying. Something will change. Greater things than these will you do because I go to my Father. I want to invite you because we are going to pray. I am going to agree with you. But if you've got something in your life, I want to invite you to stand right now. And we are going to pray because God is ready to do what Jesus has already made possible. And let's pray. Say, in Jesus' name, I stand in the authority that Jesus has given me. And I thank you, God, that you've already dealt with this situation. And right now, I speak to, and I want you to, whatever it is you're dealing with, you can whisper it or whatever you need to say, if it's too embarrassing to say it in your head. (laughs) I say, I speak to this, and in Jesus' name, this thing must come under the power and authority of Jesus Christ and God's rightness. I don't accept it any longer. Jesus, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you. I want you to just begin to thank him. You're watching online. Just begin to thank him. God, we thank you that sickness is being broken. God, we thank you that answers are coming. We thank you that disease is being eradicated. God, we thank you that cancer is being eradicated. God, we thank you for marriages being healed. We thank you for finances turning around. We thank you for people that have been so far from you coming home to you. And God, we declare that in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, everyone just with your eyes closed. I'm going to pray for you, God. Those that have been disappointed by prayers not being answered, God, we break the power of disappointment now in Jesus' name. Forgive us for thinking we have to get the answer or we have to do the right things to make the answer come and pray the right way to make the prayers get answered. God, the answer is up to you. We stand and we enforce your rightness. And we say health, wholeness, healing, restoration, peace, goodness, strength, 
power, abundance. That is the rightness of God in every single situation. In Jesus' name. Church, I want one more prayer with your eyes closed. Those that you've not said yes to Jesus, this is your chance. It's like I said earlier, man, you can go through your whole life and miss out on becoming the person Jesus already made you to be. A new creation. And this prayer that we're all going to pray together is a way of saying yes to this wonderful, amazing reality. Will you pray with me? Say, Jesus, thank you for a brand new start that you've made possible for me through your life and death and your resurrection. I say yes to following you and yes to a brand new start in your name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God thanks. Can we? People that are saying yes to him for the first time. People that are praying online, man, it's so exciting. So good. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.